about the troubles and where it all started in a place called Free Derry and where there was rioting and you're going to see the murals on the walls. Derry. My name is Ronan McNamara and just in case some of you think that your eyes are deceiving you, please uh, do not be alarmed. Your vision is fine. I just happen to have a Chinese mammy and an Irish daddy, so hence the name Ronan McNamara. I, I also possess a mum who is a Buddhist and one might say she's neither a Protestant Buddhist nor a Catholic Buddhist, so if any of you do have any questions you'd like to ask, please feel free to do so. It will be your only opportunity ever to get to meet a Buddhist guide in Northern Ireland, so I'd be not afraid. It's a great pleasure to have you here uh, in the city today as a, as a father of three young children and as a teacher here in the city. Uh, the fact that, that we're getting tourists now coming to Northern Ireland is a great sign of change in, in itself. So we've great hope for the next generation of young Catholics and Protestants that maybe, just maybe, we might have a new generation of peace. Northern Ireland, however, will challenge you in the, in the sense that uh, even though the fire is out, you'll still be able to feel the embers of the past, all these divisions. And the first place I'm going to take you now is into an area called the Bog Side, show you all the political murals in there, events like Bloody Sunday, uh, 1972, the Hunger Strikes, 1981, Bobby Sands. You might also remember a young woman by the name of Bernadette Devlin. And so all these murals will conjure up these images of a very turbulent past. Now, as we uh, make our way out of here, uh, this building on the left-hand side, lovely building, it looks like a church from the outside, but is our city hall, the Guild Hall. And it was built in 1890. It was destroyed by fire in 1908, and it was destroyed again by two IRA bombs on the 12th and 16th of June 1972. Amazingly, nobody was killed or seriously injured when the bombs went off inside there. In fact, the only artifact to survive the blast inside the city hall, would you believe it, was a statue of Queen Victoria. And even though the bombs were left beside her, she still managed to survive. Now, she made a jump that would have won the Olympics back in 1972. She jumped 18 feet to her right where she fell flat on her face and her head fell off. And that was the only damage that was caused to the great lady. And she's a wonderful advertisement for Sicilian marble, which is what she's made out of. He blew the building up. His name was Jerry Doherty, and Jerry was a member of the IRA. He was sentenced to prison for a number of years, but when he got out a few years after, you might say he did the normal thing in Northern Ireland. He stood for election. Uh, not only did he stand, but he got elected, and he sat inside the very building that he blew up as an elected member of Parliament for four years. Now, uh, it's not uncommon for historians to sometimes tell you that the terrorists of today are the politicians of tomorrow, and uh, uh, there's no finer example than here in Northern Ireland. Now, the river's on your right-hand side, uh, the river uh, Foyle, and that river was a very strategic location for the Allied forces during the Second World War. There were thousands of Americans, Canadians, French, Dutch, British forces all stationed along there. 1945 itself, 64 uh, German U-boats came up the river and surrendered to the Allies. The submarines were subsequently scuttled, off at Ireland's most northerly point at a place called Malinhead in County Donegal. London had fallen during the Second World War. This city was to become the main administration and communications headquarters for the Allies. Now, Mick's going to take the next turn here to the left, and this will take us into an area very shortly called the Bogside. Uh, there was a wonderful book called Trinity by Leon Uris, uh, written about this city and its environs, and many of the central characters would have come from the Bogside area. Quick glance up to your right, uh, the lovely Espire of St. Eugene's Cathedral, which is the Catholic cathedral dating back to 1853, located in a district called the Rosemount District, where many of the historic shirt factories would have been located. Now, we're just at the edge of the Bogside. I mean, the Bogside was a scene of so much violence here uh, during the 1970s and uh, 80s and uh, this uh, was often referred to by the British Army as a no-go area but keep your eyes now to your right hand side you'll see four faces of Mother Teresa Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King and a local man by the name of John Hume who received a Nobel Prize for Peace John has been one of our leading politicians here over the last uh, generation instrumental during the whole peace process uh, the man that you see here on the right hand side you see that man with the beard his name is Raymond McCartney and Raymond was involved in what was known as the hunger strikes in 1981 
uh, I mentioned Bobby Sands and of course Bobby Sands was elected as a member of parliament in Westminster whilst he was starving himself to death. This was really the emergence of what we now call Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin is an Irish word which means we ourselves and they would essentially be the political wing of the IRA. And we've often talked about the IRA subsequent from 1981 as the IRA using the ballot box in one hand and the Armalite in the other. So this is the first you know, time that you begin to see the IRA using politics because Bobby Sands, as I said, was elected as a member of parliament whilst he was starving himself to death. Be a little bit like you know, a, a man in your own country who, who was uh, in prison for terrorist charges and him standing for election. Can you imagine the, the media publicity that would surround that? And this was the first time that the IRA began seeing, my God, we're getting more media publicity by having one of our men uh, been elected as all the bombing that took place in the 10 years before it. Uh, here, back here to your right hand side, you, you see the new type of mural emerging in such a troubled area. This is the mural of peace of the dove and the oak leaf, and that's the last mural to have actually been erected up here. So, again, it's showing you that such troubled areas like the bogside are also emerging from the, the conflict with a more gentle type of mural um, that, that uh, as I said, has emerged here over the last few years. The reason how these murals uh, came about at all was previous to this, you would have seen. Uh, members of the IRA with guns and balaclavas and uh, um, signs saying, you, you, and you'll see another sign here saying you are now entering Free Derry. So these were very provocative murals. Now the murals that uh, are shown really are showing you different scenes from the past uh, 30 to 40 years. Now we'll just go on a little bit further and just coming up here on the right hand side you'll see another mural. It says, now this is a very interesting mural and, and very important because to me it highlights the real frustration of ordinary people. I know we focus a lot on religion and the Irish English question and that's important, but to me this is as important. Civil rights, anti-sectarian, one man, one vote, jobs, not creed. Look at the profile of the person who's protesting there. And I mean, you know, they're not terrorists. They're students, they're teachers, they're doctors, they're nurses, they're the clergy. And most importantly, uh, they are a mixture of both Catholics and Protestants. Uh, I don't know whether you know, but that, you know, during the, the 1960s and 70s here, unless you were a landowner or a property owner, you had no voting rights whatsoever. Nearly 50% of this city's adult population did not have a vote. Now, it wasn't that unusual for 8, 10, 12, 14 adults to be living in one house or one apartment, but it was only one vote per house. And the powers that be in Northern Ireland did not want to develop more social housing because the more social housing they developed, the more votes they were giving away. It's an awful pity we didn't resolve the issue because it played right into the hands of the extremist organisations. Back here you'll also see a young girl looking at a British Army Saracen. You might remember Tiananmen Square uh, in, uh, in 1989 with the Chinese student and tank, and it's loosely based on uh, that particular image. The bog side was uh, referred to as a no-go area uh, during the, the, 19, um, the, the 1970s, and in fact, in this area here, which is called Glen Father Park, three of the victims of Bloody Sunday died. Bloody Sunday occurred on the 30th of January 1972 when 14 men were shot dead by the British Army. And, uh, you know, till this day, both sides blamed each other. We're just after coming out of a new inquiry, you might have seen it, it was, this became the longest and most expensive inquiry in British legal history. Just take a look back here to your right hand side and you'll see a British Army soldier uh, during an operation called Operation Motorman, one of the largest British Army operations carried out since the Suez Canal crisis in uh, the 1950s. A uh, bloody Sunday uh, occurred on the 30th of January 1972 during a civil rights protest and a year after Bloody Sunday a man by the name of the Lord Chief Justice Widgery carried out a tribunal on behalf of the British government and a tribunal exonerated the British Army for firing upon the crowd in the bogside here. The victims' relatives and the Catholic community at large were incensed and they have been calling for a new independent inquiry ever since. In 1997 there was a new British Prime Minister elected by the name of Tony Blair and he launched another investigation into Bloody Sunday but I'm sure he didn't realise that he would be out of government and the inquiry would still be going on in his absence. Now this inquiry became the longest and most expensive inquiry of British legal history. It went on for 12 and a half years at the cost of 200 million pounds sterling and 5,000 pages later the inquiry was only released about four months ago. The inquiry itself was amazing because it exonerated and it refuted every single word virtually that the last inquiry said and more or less said that all 14 people who died on Bloody Sunday were completely innocent of any wrongdoing. And you can see a, an image from Bloody Sunday there of Father Edward Daly, the parish priest at the time, waving the white handkerchief, carrying one of the victims, 17-year-old John Duddy, into the ambulance. And that was actually taken uh, from direct video.
video footage of Bloody Sunday. So, now, Father Daly was uh, on the civil rights protest that particular day, and in his autobiography, he's now retired, he became Bishop Daly. He talks about um, when the British Army opened fire, everybody started running in different directions, and 17-year-old John Duddy was running by him. And he, uh, John, uh, went to uh, w w was uh, one of uh, the young um, boys who used to go to church, and he was uh, he, he was slagging um, Father Daly off uh, because he was a little bit overweight, and he was saying, "Father, you're eating far too many Sunday dinners. You're going to have to get yourself in shape." And two seconds later, uh, John was shot in the back of the head, and uh, that's the that's the direct scene in the aftermath of Bloody Sunday itself. Um, in front of you, you'll see the very famous wall. It's, it says, "You are now entering Free Derry." The Catholic community called the city Derry. The Protestant community called it London Derry. Free Derry is a political state because the people of the Bogside, make no mistake about it, will still tell you that they want an end to British rule. A man by the name of Jerry Adams, whose support uh, will come from Catholic communities like this here. Really all that has changed is the method from violence to politics, whereas a lot of people in the 1970s in areas here who would have supported the armed conflict of the IRA, they now support Sinn Féin's politics of trying to negotiate a deal, and really that's all that has changed in Northern Ireland. Now, uh, take a look here to your right-hand side. Uh, you might recognise this young woman, Bernadette Devlin. She made quite a number of trips over to the United States of America. She became the youngest person elected as a member of Parliament in Westminster. She herself survived an assassination attempt in 1981. She's not involved in politics today, but heavily involved in women's issues uh, in Northern Ireland. She lives just outside Belfast. Her name is Bernadette McAlliskey. And uh, you'll also notice, and I'll just uh, have a look at the young uh, girl there on her knees with the garbage bin lid. I'll tell you a little story about her. I had a group of 16-year-old boys from Belfast here recently who were asking me a question about that that young girl with the garbage bin laid on her knees and I'll tell you a little story about her in a few minutes. Now, um, before we go over to fire, you'll see a young man with a gas mask there about to throw a petrol bomb, which again would have been a familiar sight here during the uh, 1970s. And the last mural that you'll see is a very poignant mural. I mean, to me, this strikes at the heart of everything because I know we focus an awful lot on religion here, but when I look at this mural, it, it, you know, I just see the human cost of all of this. Uh, you know, I think of my own daughter. Uh, I think of anybody who has children. Um, that this uh, mural here is, is called The Death of Innocence. And it's a 14-year-old girl by the name of Annette McGavigan who became the first child victim of Northern Ireland's conflict when she died in 1971. The mural itself is called The Death of Innocence, the butterfly representing the innocence, the gun representing death, and all the, the grayness around her is a symbol of the chaos of the environment of which she was born into. On a personal level, to me it never mattered whether it was a Catholic girl or a Protestant boy or a British Army soldier, it was always somebody's child. Uh, somebody was grieving and this is why I say you know we focus so much on religion we nearly forget about the human cost of all of this all the, the mums and dads and the brothers and sisters and all the people who are grieving the loss of loved ones that's why it's so important now to try and create a new generation of young Catholics and Protestants who are not focused on conflict but focus on dialogue and negotiation now we're going to be heading up over the flyover a uh, quick glance up to your left I mean, you can see why this area is called the bog side. This was a bog, a bog, I suppose, defined as a marsh, but also a low-lying area, poor area, and up there to the left, the walls. That's really the, the changeover, the change of the guard from Gaelic Irish rule, from the O'Neills, the O'Donnells, the O'Doherty's, the O'Kane's, to the beginning of the British Empire's rule in the northern half of Ireland, which was known as the Plantations of Ulster. Now, we'll talk more about that, of course, when we get up onto the walls itself. Left-hand side, the uh, Long Tower Catholic Church, 1783, site of an old church called the Chapel Moor, and up to the right-hand side in the distance, the city cemetery, where a very famous hymn writer is buried by the name of Cecil Francis Alexander. Now, she wrote the most beautiful hymns, like there is a green hill far away, all things bright and beautiful.